Some say you could still hear the screams coming from the dark cell, the shackles dragging against the floor, the footsteps creaking against the planks on the guard towers, and the rusty cell doors echoing at night. Built in 1876, held over 3,000 lost souls, sitting next to the Colorado River, stuck between the great states of California and Arizona. So they would stick 14 men at one time, strip them down to their undershorts, you know, only got bread, um, bread and water, and that was it. You know, they didn't have a bathroom, so wherever corner they picked is where they did their business. <laughs> it was a forward-thinking look, probably closer to the way the prisoners are taught, uh, treated today, as the earliest prisons when they were really punished. And it wasn't a place where a prisoner could escape. And there are stats, many stats, that will show you that there were very few people who tried to escape who, of course, never made it. Because back in that early 18, 1900s, the Colorado River ran rapid. This is what remains of a much more romanticized time where gunslingers freely roamed the streets. Gold and silver mining was at its peak tribesmen still defending their land and daring explorers venturing into the untamed wilderness. It's all written within each wall, carved in every stone. But what really makes this old penitentiary stand above the rest? Is it the ghosts that reside inside? The history of its construction or the location it sits upon? It's hard to believe that anybody should consider this place to be habitable for any creature on earth, let alone an insect. It's even harder to believe that civilizations like these manage to last this long without withering away by the dry temperatures and scorching heat. But over time we have learned that local inhabitants managed to endure such conditions for a very long time, even before the idea of manifest destiny, before the American frontier came to the southwest. Fourteen hundred and fifty miles long, stretching from Colorado to northern Mexico, the Colorado River, providing life and prosperity for both settlers and its inhabitants, especially in the area we come to know as Yuma. And the earliest and most notable inhabitants of the area were the Cocopa and the Kishan tribes, thriving for centuries along the lower banks of the river early explorers like Hernando de Arcon and Marquior Diaz would later come to know them as humans, coming from the Spanish word humo, which means smoke. They would become the first official residents of Yuma. We have native people here, tribal people. In the case right behind me is the Quetzan Indian tribe, who have been here from time out of mind. They have the gold rush. They have thousands of people crossing the narrows of the Colorado River on their property. So there are all kinds of interesting, I guess you would say, junctions of different native people versus immigrants who are of every ethnicity. As noted before, the river communities not only managed to survive the harsh conditions of the Sonoran Desert, but also the coming futures of Spanish conquest, religious conformity, and American settlement across the Southwest, maintaining and adapting through their way of life for centuries to come. Um, 
We had the Indian tribes here that were parts of the Colorado who already were doing trade with a lot of the army who utilized the Colorado River. So they just started settling and the Indian tribe really was um, very, played big roles in that. You know, the trade, what they needed, food and clothing and, and um, you know, furs and things like that. So they did a lot of trade um, and it also helped when the army brought extra foods and different things that they, they provided to the, the Indian tribes. So, it became apparent to the locals of the area that Yuma was going to face major changes thanks to the search of gold that started in the late 1500s. But it wasn't until 1845 where the rumors of Californian gold hit across the entire Midwest to the eastern seaboard, and Yuma was stuck in the middle of it, becoming the main gateway to the Golden State. Back in the early 1800s, we had a lot of people who were given advice or kind of news that trickled to the east side of the territories. And all of them started realizing that the California area had gold. And so everyone decided that they were gonna move west. And you'll hear that in a lot of the movies, everyone heading west. Well, they're heading west for gold. That's the dream because that was gold fever struck the United States. People quit their jobs, mostly men, not a lot of women came, not families at right away. So those, you know, these large groups of men were along this trail following the Gila River, it was known as the Gila Trail. The Gila and the Colorado Rivers met right here behind us at the confluence of the Colorado River. The territories of Arizona barely ceded from Mexico, yet changes were noticeable as trade between the locals and other states started to shape the town thanks to the dreams of gold. Unfortunately, California had no gold to offer to incoming settlers from the east, so another precious resource was exploited to the Yuma residents, and that was the river itself providing trade and industry. But it wasn't only trade from the steamboat industry that was their only source of income. For their second source of income and their precious resource became agriculture. I mean, you know, Yuma's very small and to be able to talk to the people that were born and raised here, you'll find that their family history, I mean, that's what everybody did was you know, either farmed out here, did citrus out here, or worked at the prison, or, you know, worked at the first fire department, ice plant, all that kind of stuff, you know, when they were first established. So it's, it's kind of fun being a part of all that history because it certainly makes you appreciate what you have and how it got started and where it came from. You know, like we had cotton fields like you wouldn't believe. And you rarely see those anymore. I don't know where they're growing cotton now. I mean, it was, you'd go down 16th Street and there was all kinds of farming on either side and there was cotton, tall cotton. and It was pretty fun, it was, it was neat. And that's when you could go, you could go into a field. I mean, people didn't steal all that. It was to look at it. And now, of course, if you go in there, you'll get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and so, with its new system of trade, incoming exports and resources, the area would steadily grow to become a very prominent town, but like all new civilizations, they must face untold danger in an untamed environment. Crime and debauchery would begin to follow, given the Southwest and its famous moniker, the Wild West. Lawmen from far and wide come to try to maintain law and order, they were no match for the ever-growing rate of crime, and the jailhouses were not enough to hold them in, until the 8th Territorial Legislature of 1875 granted authorization of the territorial penitentiaries in Phoenix. There was a competition when Yuma was awarded the prison site. 
it was open. There were other communities that wanted it because they were really good jobs, a good secure job. And what happened here is that Jose Maria Redondo, very important name in the Yuma community, he was a politician, very important. J.B. Kelly, another politician, and they were both legislators that went up to Phoenix or wherever there, the meetings were being held in early Arizona. And they knew that this, that this was a good site because it was surrounded by water on three sides. So this is jutting out into the Colorado River. So Jose Maria Redondo and J.B. Kelly uh, came to their meeting in Phoenix and they were going to decide on where the university would be and where the prison was going to be and where the state capital was going to be. Mm -hmm. So they did the state capital, which was Prescott, and then they did um, you know, a couple other votes. And when it came to the prison, they decided this prison would be in Phoenix. But J.B. Kelly and Jose Maria Redondo raced Phoenix and rode in Yuma. It was the last vote. Everybody wanted to go home. They snapped it, and Yuma got the prison. Later switched to Yuma which brings us to this fine institution caught between California and Arizona, the Alcatraz of the desert, Yuma Territorial Prison, 